Hello everyone, welcome to session two of LTech 654 Programming Games and Simulations. I want to begin this week by reflecting on Critical Reflection 1, press play to start, and complimenting all of you on your creative and enthusiastic introductory videos. They really helped me get to know all of you in terms of your backgrounds, academic and professional, as well as your relationship to games and, of course, programming. So thanks for jumping right in with that first assignment. And I want to give a special shout out to all of the folks who, who went in and commented on each other's videos. That's really fantastic and is helping us build a sense of community in this online asynchronous class. So thanks very much. Now, one of the things I always do is take a look at the results from the session one prior knowledge survey. So in total, there's 27 students in the class. And one of the questions was, what operating system do you use? And you can see the split here. 21 or about 78% of you are using Mac OS, and we have six people on Windows. The next question was, strongly agree to strongly disagree. I am comfortable installing new software on my primary computer. And no worries here. Everyone either agrees or strongly agrees that they are comfortable. That's a relief. And we see a similar pattern here with I am comfortable managing files stored on my primary computer. This is important in programming because we need to know where files are and how they relate to each other. So all good information there. The next item introduces a bit more variability, and that was agreeing or disagreeing with the statement, I have experience designing games. And if you take a look here at the green and the purple, we can see that 12 people or about 44% say they agree or strongly agree that they have experience designing games. And then of course, everyone else said that they were either neutral, disagree or strongly disagree. So we have a bit of variation there with 12 people saying they have experience designing games. The next item asked about having experience programming, which does not include web design, HTML or CSS, anything like that. And with this, we see a bit of a split. We have 15 people either agreeing or strongly agreeing. Again, that's the green and the purple. And then we have, we have 12 people answering neutral or disagreeing or strongly disagreeing. So we have a bit of a split there, but that's fine. We'll make it work this semester. And then finally, I have experience using Godot, and this arguably is the great equalizer. Everyone said they disagreed or strongly disagreed. Just for fun, I asked you what are three words that come to mind when you think of programming? And I did a little word cloud to show you what words were most popular. Code, of course, is the corollary of programming. Logic, fun, building, Python was popular, algorithm, details, computers, so on and so forth. So that was kind of fun. I want to give a shout out to Ronald for his three word, the three words that came to mind for him, which is syntax er error leads to cry. Very funny. Thank you for that, Ron. Much appreciated. All right. So I want to talk a little bit now about more theory related to games. And, and this is important because if we're going to program games and simulations, we need to understand what they are before we actually start to try to build them. So here's a little bit of theory related to defining games. So what exactly is a game? Well, one definition that I really like comes from Salin and Zimmerman and their book, Rules of Play. And they argue that a game is a system in which players engage in artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. Now, I really like that short and sweet definition. And let's highlight a couple of the key words here. So a game is a system. It has to have players. It has to have conflict. That conflict's defined by rules, and there has to be an outcome. And so I want you to keep those elements, those features in mind. And one of the things we'll begin doing this semester is thinking about the games that we know and play and want to create how do they operationalize or embody those particular features? 
And so what we might do, for example, is to think about some of the games I talked about last week and talked about how they represent systems and players and conflict rules and outcomes. So that's one definition. Now let's contrast that with another definition. And this definition comes from Jesper Jewell, who is a educator and a game designer and really a game-based learning theorist. And he provides a more comprehensive definition. So let's take a look at this. He writes, a game is a rule-based formal system with a variable and quantifiable outcome where different outcomes are assigned different values. The player exerts effort in order to influence the outcome. The player feels attached to the outcome and the consequences of the activity are optional and negotiable. So let's break this down. Well, first thing we'll notice, of course, is that many of the words or the features in Jules' definition mirror what Zimmerman and Salen talked about. There are rules, it's a system, there's an outcome, there's players. But Jules' definition is a little bit different because we start to see words like this. Values, effort, feelings, consequences. And so he's bringing kind of this emotional layer and arguing that that emotions are part of what makes a game a game. And in fact, he goes on to argue that there are really six key features of a game. And if you don't have these features, you probably don't have a game. So let's take a look at those. The first one is the idea of fixed rules. And everybody knows what a rule is, but what's important is the rules have to be sufficiently well-defined. Other words, everyone just argues about what the rules are and you're not really playing the game. So fixed rules are important. Next up, he argues that a key feature is variable and quantifiable outcomes. In other words, game rules must provide different possible outcomes. If the outcome of a game is always the same, then it wouldn't be fun to play. So it's that variability, the different possible outcomes that makes a game a game. Another key feature, according to Jewel, is the valorization of the outcome. Now, what does that mean? Well, he simply means that some possible outcomes in a game are better than others. And we could think about that in the games that we play. There's a difference between winning by one point and winning by 100 points, for example. And so we want to keep in mind that some outcomes in a game are better than others. Next up, we have player effort. And Jewel really argues this is a key feature. And the effort is important because players' actions influence the game state and the game outcome. And if there is no influence on the game state or the game outcome, there's no reason for the player to exert effort. So that's a, an important feature of a game. Next up, we have attachment to the outcome. And this is really a psychological phenomenon. And this is the idea that winning feels good and is desirable in the same way that losing might not feel so good. And when we have variable and quantifiable outcomes, and players put forth effort to achieve those outcomes, then the players have attachment to the outcome of the game. They want to win, or they want to feel good about the way they played in the game. And then the final feature is negotiable consequences. And this is the idea, according to Jewel, that real-life consequences may be assigned to the outcome. And so, for example, betting money on a game might be an example of negotiable consequences. Or you might play rock, paper, scissors to decide who's going to do the dishes. That's an example of assigning a real-life consequence to the outcome of the game. Okay, so now that we've thought a little bit about defining games... I want to make a distinction between game-based learning and gamification. Now, so far, the definitions we've looked at are just definitions of games. So how might we define game-based learning? Well, our reading from this week, of course, gave us one definition, but here's another definition. Game-based learning is a type of game play with defined learning outcomes. In other words, you take all of the elements of a game, such as the system, the players, the rules, the conflict, but then embedded within that are defined learning outcomes. And that's what makes game-based learning different than just game play. Now let's contrast that with gamification. Gamification is the use of game design elements in non-game contexts. 
In other words, we're taking those features and those elements of games and that are used in game-based learning, but we're applying them to non-game contexts. In other words, they're being used in contexts in which it's not a game. There are game design elements visible, but they're non-game contexts. So I want to close out by just reflecting a little bit on Steincooler and Squire's 2014 article and their conversation about what roles are games playing in education. And basically, they summarize that there are four important roles. This is important, so let's talk about it. Games as content. Well, this is the idea that games can be designed to educate. And sometimes games contain obvious connections to school subject areas, and they promote knowledge, skills, and dispositions that are valued by educators. And so all of the games that we looked at last week that I showed you were examples of games as content. They were designed to educate in math and in social studies. So that's the example of games as content. Another role that games are playing is as games as bait. And this is the idea that games are designed to entertain, and that's okay, and they probably don't contain a lot of obvious connection to school. However, because they are systems with rules that have quite a bit of challenge in them, they may actually promote valued skills and knowledge as a side effect of playing the games. And many researchers argue that games are worth studying for that reason. They can be used as bait. Now, another role games are playing in education is the idea of assessment. And this is the idea that games should be studied as forms of authentic assessment. Now, what does that mean? It's this idea that if someone is playing a game and they're succeeding at the game, we don't need to stop the game and then give them a test to see if they know how to play the game. We can see through the actual act of playing the game that they are getting better and progressing in the game. Now, I want you to contrast that with education, where we do a whole bunch of teaching and learning, and then we stop and give students a test. So many educators and researchers argue that games as assessment is an interesting paradigm that should be studied. And then the final role that games are playing in education is this idea that games are really engaging and we should study them as sites of engaged learning. We want to understand what is it that makes players exert effort? Why do people play games? And what is it about their mechanics that make it fun and enjoyable to spend large amounts of times doing things that are really difficult? And that's something, of course, that we want to have in education, but don't always achieve. And so we really want to look at games as kind of studies of actual engagement on the part of players and or learners. So those are four roles that games are playing in education. Okay, we're out of time for this week. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.